Hey guys, welcome back to another session on diabetes mellitus. I am Dr. Ravi. So in this session, we are learning about prediabetes and how hormonal modifications leads to rapid progression of the disease and what is the management. So when we see the patients with hypertension, myocardial infarction and stroke, we suspect the diabetes. But when we measure the plasma glucose levels of uh, these patients, they are near normal or normal. So their HbA1c levels are less than 6.5%. So when we measure the plasma insulin levels of these patients, so their plasma insulin levels are quite high. So there is hyperinsulinemia in most of the patients. So this implicates the macrovascular complications occurs in pre-diabetic state itself. So once the diabetes is established, so nothing is left in, your, in our hand with respect to the macrovascular complications. So it is better we manage the disease in pre-diabetic state itself. So once you are diagnosed with the diabetes from now on, if you strictly do the glycemic control for five years, you can avoid the microvascular complications like retinopathy and neuropathy. So how hormonal modification leads to rapid progression of the disease? The story starts with insulin resistance. So insulin resistance, then there will be abnormal abnormal lipid metabolism lipid metabolism metabolism then impaired insulin secretion and low grade inflammation So insulin resistance and abnormal lipid metabolism leads to impaired insulin secretion. So eventually disease, eventually disease progresses to diabetes mellitus. Okay. Now insulin resistance. What is the cause of insulin resistance? There is genetic factor, genetic factor plus environmental factor. So genetic factor alone is not enough. So in identical twins, it is 70 to 80 percent concordant prevalence is there. And if the both parents are diabetic, uh, then 40 percent chance of getting diabetes. So genetic factor is alone not enough. So any factor which causes increase in insulin secretion, so if it, any factor which causes the hyperinsulinemia will lead to insulin resistance. So the precise molecular mechanism of insulin resistance is not known but in presence of hyperinsulinemia there is decrease in or there is reduction in insulin receptor levels and reduction in tyrosine kinase activity. So it is a post receptor defect. So it is secondary to the hyperinsulinemia. Now there is hyperinsulinemia insulinemia so which leads to hyperglycemia now this hyperglycemia is sensed by the beta cell of the pancreas and there is compensatory increase in insulin output so there is compensatory increase in insulin output okay Suppose if we are giving a glucose, oral glucose water to a normal person and to a insulin resistant patient and if we measure the plasma glucose and plasma insulin of these patients and if we, uh, the measurement should be every hourly, so first, second, third and fourth hourly. So how the glucose curve will be? So initial first two hours glucose will rise and then it come to its basal level. In a normal person, plasma insulin follows the glucose curve but in insulin resistant patient, plasma insulins are sky high, quite high. There is lot of insulin is produced. So it's hyperinsulinemia. Now insulin is an anabolic hormone. So it promotes the fat deposition into the adipose tissue, especially in a stomach, viscera and around the hip leading to centripetal obesity. Centripetal obesity so what happens in centripetal obesity by unknown mechanism there would be transformation of the receptor from alpha to beta 3 receptors so which results in uncontrolled uncontrolled lipolysis 
so which produces free fatty acids and adipokines now adipokines they regulates the body weight appetite and energy expenditure and it also modulates the insulin sensitivity so along with the free fatty acids they causes insulin resistance in skeleton muscle and liver and adipokines also produces low grade inflammation low grade inflammation that's why uh, the crps crp is raised in the type 2 diabetes patient now coming to the free fatty acids so free fatty acids through the portal system portal system they reaches into the liver in the liver they are supposed to be taken up by the mitochondria for the beta oxidation but it will not occur so because to take up to uh, be, to undergo the beta oxidation fatty acid has to be taken up by the mitochondria now mitochondrial cell membrane should be expressed with the carnitine palmitoyl transferase but the mitochondrial cell membrane will not express the cpt so it will take the another form so which will form the fatty acyl coa now this fatty acyl coa causes insulin resistance and hepatic glucose production glucose production so hepatic glucose production leading to glucose toxicity glucose toxicity now as there is a influx the as there is a fatty acid free fatty acid flux what happens the liver try to clear the uh, free fatty acids which results in excessive formation of triglycerides and decreased hdl levels and relatively increased or normal ldl levels so there is lipotoxicity lipotoxicity so there is glucose toxicity and lipose toxicity now glucose toxicity lipotoxicity which will leads to increased the progression in the insulin resistance and there is increased insulin secretion so hyperinsulinemia few individuals cannot withstand this hyperinsulinemia because of the beta cell exhaustion so there will be decrease in production of insulin so insulin is reduced so when there is decrease in production of insulin which results in elevated elevated postprandial postprandial plasma glucose levels now insulin is the insulin secretion is decreased so what happens there is relatively relatively over production of over production production of glucagon glucagon now this glucagon will cause the hepatic glucose production so which will lead to impaired or elevated fasting plasma glucose level so now fasting plasma glucose levels are elevated and postprandial plasma glucose levels are also elevated now as there is a free fatty acid flux and uh, accumulation of some lipid into the skeleton myocytes there is formation of reactive oxygen species now this reactive oxygen species decreases the production of nitric oxide in vascular endothelium so which will lead to hardening of the blood vessel wall so eventually lead to hypertension so now if you see number 1 there is centripetal obesity so the waist circumference more than 95 in european population and more than 90 in indian population in male and 80 80 in female number 1 number second is if there is more than 150 
milligram per deciliter triglyceride levels and third point is we'll write down here HDL levels if HDL levels are less than less than 40 and fourth point is blood pressure BP systolic blood pressure if it is more than 130 and diastolic blood pressure if it is more than 85 mm of Hg and fifth point is more than or equal to fasting plasma glucose levels more than or equal to 100 milligram per deciliter so these are the features of these are the features of metabolic syndrome so if you look at the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes the metabolic syndrome all the metabolic syndromes you can come across so if 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 the three out of five if any person any patient having three out of five these features they are diagnosed as metabolic syndrome patients now we have learnt the pathophysiology if you summarize the whole story in a nutshell insulin is a culprit so insulin is a big elephant in the room if you bring the insulin levels down everything will be taken care of so what you're supposed to do is there any medication for that so no medication till now there is no medication to bring the insulin levels down and to prevent the prediabetes or to reverse the prediabetic state and delay the onset of diabetes dietary changes and lifestyle modifications are you know by uh, some studies says that by 58 percent lifestyle modification and dietary changes has reduced or reversed and the pharmacological agent used in prediabetic state is controversial because of their uh, cost effectiveness and safety profile so ada is considering the metformin so metformin in a patients with bmi more than or equal to 35 kg per meter square and gestational diabetic mothers gestational diabetes patients so the high risk patients who those who are less than 60 years of age So lifestyle modifications and dietary changes can reverse either reverse or delays the onset, delay the onset of diabetes by 58%. So what are the dietary changes and what are the lifestyle modifications we are supposed to do? So I am here with the five suggestions. Number one, exercise. So wake up early in the morning and go for a morning walk. The insulin resistant patients are not allowed to do the vigorous or strenuous exercise because there might be underlying vascular complications. So brisk walk for 30 to 40 minutes is enough. And when I say go for a morning walk, it is better you go for a outdoor walk rather running on the treadmill. So outdoor walk has got its own benefit. Number two. So what happens to the insulin when you consume the food so insulin levels will reach us to its peak within half an hour of food intake and it will come to its basal level by four to five hours time now we were told to stay healthy we are supposed to eat three meal and two snacks per day tea and coffee anyway it is complimentary when you eat your breakfast at 8 o'clock, your insulin levels will reach us to peak by 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning and your first tea come at 10.30. So here your insulin levels not yet come to the basal level, yet you are triggering the another spurt of insulin secretion. So you are, you are producing the more and more and more insulin. So already in, because of the insulin resistance, there is hyperinsulinemia so hyperinsulinemia is a burden now you are producing more insulin so it is further progresses the disease so what you are supposed to do you are supposed to bring your insulin levels down so you are supposed to adapt a feed eating pattern that is fast and feast mechanism fast and feast mechanism 
so first one is exercise second is eating pattern so you are supposed to have at least 8 hours time gap between your first and second meal and 16 hours time gap between your second and first meal so this will helps you to bring your insulin levels down once the insulin levels will come down your plasma glucose levels will come down your lipid profile will be normal and you can reduce your weight and very important thing is you can your gut health will be improved when you are doing the intermittent fasting so intermittent fasting will really helps you to bring your insulin levels down and so that you can reverse your pre diabetic state next number 3 what to eat eat low carb diet with adequate fat protein and fiber don't eat refined food processed food or food that comes with the label so when you eat the processed food they are devoid of fibers so they have got a high glycemic index so which will cause the increased insulin secretion when we eat the natural food in a natural food it contains the carbohydrate though it contains the carbohydrate it also consists the fiber now this fiber will form around form a mesh around the carbohydrate so there is a gradual absorption of the glucose which will lead to appropriate insulin secretion so when you are consuming the refined food the processed food it is a carbohydrate so the harmful bacteria will feed upon the carbohydrate and this bacterial cell wall is made up of lipopolysaccharide so this lipopolysaccharide will escape through the intestinal epithelium into the blood stream when they enters into the blood stream it causes immune stimulation which will eventually leads to formation of atherosclerosis and when you are consuming the whole food which consists the fiber the fiber is not for you we don't digest the fiber fiber is for our friendly bacteria there is a symbiotic relationship so this friendly bacteria consumes the fiber and produces the free fat short chain fatty acid sorry this fiber the friendly bacteria will consume the fiber and it produces the short chain fatty acid so this short chain fatty acids helps you to build the gut health it also helps you to produce the mucus so that you can prevent the leaky gut syndrome and then number 4 adequate sleep when i say adequate sleep it is not about the quantity of the sleep it is about the quality of the sleep as a generation we are all addicted to the electronic gadgets so you better keep all the electronic gadgets aside one hour before you going to the bed you must maintain the sleep hygiene if you look at the blue light you can't sleep because your melatonin hormone is not produced so switch off the light darkness really helps you produce the melatonin hormone and in yogic sciences they say uh, take a warm water shower and light a lamp with organic oil and cotton wig in it i don't know by what mechanism it helps but it helps last but not the least very very essential mental health so as a generation we are witnessing more and more cases of mental illness so we are doing gymming jogging running yoga what not everything to maintain the physical health but what we are doing to maintain our mental health so i am suggesting you to do the yoga and meditation so meditation really prevents the thought diarrhea in your brain and it brings a clarity so you have come here as a life you live your life to the fullest possibilities so if you adopt this five lifestyle modifications it will help you to build your physical as well as mental health in subsequent videos i will be discussing about insulin and oral hypoglycemic drugs thank you for watching thanks a lot